and welcome to CNBC Africa Exchange alongside WEF Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanjwa, and in this conversation, we're looking at the new era of banking, and we're leaving no stones unturned in terms of understanding the disruption that is going to be shaping the future of banking. We're talking about transforming the sector. We're looking at regulation. We're looking at fintechs. We're looking at blockchain. We're looking also at the culture of embracing that disruption. And joining me to bring in their voices, their insights, and their expertise into the conversation. Closest to me, I'm joined by Adam McDowell. He's the managing director and partner at BCG South Africa. He's also head of BCG Sub-Saharan Africa. And on the far end is Tariq uh, Kieran. He is the CEO of Time Bank, which is South Africa's first digital bank. And maybe, Tariq, I'll start off with you, because for the longest time, when we talk about banking collectively as a sector, in South Africa anyway, one would always talk about the big four. But if you look at the landscape now, it seems as if uh, the concept of the big four big four rather, is beginning to fade slowly. And I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit on what, the, what is emerging in terms of an industry perspective, but also if you could talk to us about what does it actually mean to be a digital bank? Um, I think v different people have different mental models what a digital bank is. For, for me, it's quite simple. You drive as much um, customer engagement to the digital channels uh, and the reason you do that is because it's benefited by ubiquity, low cost access, uh, and so on. Um, and But one of the reasons you do that is because you're trying to pipe the data into one repository. And, and electrons are amazing things because they carry infinite amounts of data and they carry them very cheaply. And then to use that data to fulfill the customer's needs better. Mm -hmm. And then probably the last conceptual uh, concept just to round this out is the digitization of the process layer because you don't want to end up hiring thousands of people in the back office. It just defeats the purpose. So, so that's my particular mental model of what a, of what a digital bank is. Um, what you see in South Africa is an emergence of different um, players. So you've got uh, fintechs, um, and, and we can talk a little bit about that. You know, uh, I think fintechs play an incredibly important role in the financial services ecosystem, but for very specific reasons, I think they struggle to get scale. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've, you've got the big four, and they do what they do, mm -hmm. but you, what you're seeing is as an increasing um, customer demand for a digital experience. So that these organizations are embarking on these massive uh, digital transformation programs. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what you see emerging finally is this era of neobanking, as we call it now, and that's where Time Bank fits in. This is a fully regulated uh, entity that, that, that banks in a digital way. Mm -hmm. Now, what's very important to distinguish uh, in the South African context, at least, is that uh, I personally don't subscribe to a pure digital banking model as a construct for delivering financial inclusion to ordinary South Africans. Because as soon as you go digital only, you either find yourself in one of two places. Yeah. The, the one is you find yourself in, in some sort of a niche, maybe mm -hmm. uh, targeting the millennial segment, or you find yourself going up the mm -hmm. value chain into, into the affluent. Mm. So, so just in terms of the experience then uh, as a consumer engaging with digital bank, uh, with time bank, excuse me, how would that be different if I were engaging with one of the big four? Um, uh, from a touch point perspective, yeah. from product services offering, how would I know that this experience is characteristically the experience of a digital bank? And I wouldn't get that in a bank that is um, not digital at the core. Yeah, I always come back to the three pillars I always, I always <coughs> talk about, and that's um, the, the big banks are still too expensive, too complex to understand, and many times inconvenient to use. Um, and what we've done is we've differentiated ourselves in each of those categories. So, so if you look at the, 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 the concept of access and improved access, there's, there's two things in our business model that are uniquely different. The one is our customer onboarding process. It's absolutely seamless. It happens inside a grocery store um, enabled with world-class uh, technology um, in a sort of seamless experience. And that's very important mm -hmm. because it's the gateway for the customer into our world, if you like. So that's the first component. The second component is really around... 
um, the facilitation of uh, deposits and withdrawals. Right. Because in our society, that's absolutely critical for customers. You, you know, being wiring money into an account and wiring money out is is is, is not practical and, and doesn't have big application. And there we've integrated into into the retail mm. still point system, and we can offer that incredibly low cost mm. um, because you are leveraging an existing cash handling capability. Yeah. So, so, and that then translates into better pricing. Mm. Right? So, for example, if you look at, at cash in, uh, four rand per thousand rand at the toll point, um, the next uh, most cost-efficient price point in the market for that quantum of deposit, sorry, I beg your pardon, it's four rand for 3,000 rand, is actually 30 rand. So you're talking about uh, orders of magnitude um, more cost-effective. Um, then, then once you, then you, once you subscribe to our platform, um, the the experience is 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 one that I would describe as empowering um, and transparent. So we don't have complex pricing structures, no ad valorem, no decimal points, none of that stuff. It's a simple fee structure yeah. where you either uh, most transactions are free or two rand, some are four and eight rand, um, and 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 also very clear on how we um, pay. Uh, what I believe is one of the market leading rates on, on, on savings. So thank you very much, for, uh, Tariq, for, Tariq, for just giving us uh, that insight. I want to take it at a higher level, Adam, and look at it sectorially. When we, when we started off, I said the concept of the big four as just the key dominant players in the market is, con is fast becoming challenged, and players like Time Bank and, and, and others are <coughs> entering the market. From your perspective, what does the future of the sector look like, and are we likely going to see more players similar to Time coming in and giving us a more colorful sense of what the banking experience can be like? Thanks. Uh, I think to be able to answer that, we must first uh, identify what are the big forces of change that are happening now. And, mm. and broadly, we can see four big changes happening. Mm. Number one, uh, customers are used to a much simpler and efficient customer experience uh, than before. And they don't, they don't actually compare banks versus bank. They, they compare banking versus Netflix versus Amazon, mm. which is much more e Uber, you know, much easier, um, uh, more personalized, more, much more convenient experience. So that's kind of what the benchmark <laughs> against. So customer experience and expectations are radically changing. Number two, technology is also changing. So it's much more connected uh, mm -hmm. than before. And people have access to technology uh, much easier than before, i.e. through cell phones, as an example. The third thing is around data. Uh, and uh, not only data that you can access through your own company, but you can also access other, you can buy third-party data. Mm -hmm. And if you, can, if you are able to analyze that data, it can radically change the way you can go to market towards customers. Mm -hmm. And the fourth thing is more around the macroeconomic environment and regulatory environment. Mm. Uh, and as you can see, mm. big picture, of course, US, China, Brexit, huge change happening. But also locally in South Africa, we have interesting changes in terms of KYC, consumer mm. protection, etc. So those are the four big things that are happening mm -hmm. in the market right now. And the way we see people respond to that is a bit different. The, Torik's problem is that if you look at the, uh, sorry Torik, <laughs> for that, uh, is that uh, if you look at the cus typical customer journey experience, yeah. They would like to, uh, maybe they go, for example, when they want to buy a house, getting credit for the house is yeah. not what they want to do. They want to buy the house. Getting credit is just a uh, hassle for them. It, ha it has to be done, but they don't really want to do it. Mm -hmm. but, what, but, but the journey is basically you sit online, maybe at home at night, you know, checking out different, different you know, mm -hmm. prices and experiences. Then you will go online on your phone. Then maybe you want to go in the branch, talk to someone. There are still, if you look at banking today, there are still many points where you want physical affirmation and advice on many of the critical journeys. For example, buying a house, yeah. investing my money, that kind of stuff. Yes, you can go through it all digital, and if you can do that for the easier journeys, but for the more complex journeys, you still need a combination of digital and human. And we call that the, the emergence of bionic banking. Mm. So the future is going to be bionic, we feel, that yes, you can digitize a lot of the journeys, yeah. but there are critical moments of truth in the journey where you need to have a human interface. Doesn't have to be a branch uh, interface. Could also be delivered uh, video conference or other ways of chatbot or other ways of doing it. But you want to talk to someone, you want to feel good about your choice. So you have to have yeah. a bionic experience. And mm. this is where the incumbent banks and you can, it's easy to laugh of them, but they're actually they look at the guys like Time and they take it very they, do, they take it very seriously. 
uh, and they are inventing themselves uh, also. So mm -hmm. what you will see as a consumer is much more personalized experience, the combination of digital and physical uh, mm -hmm. advice through the journey. And, uh, and of course, the big four, as you, mm -hmm. you name them, they have the brand, they have the people, they have the capital. Uh, to kind of compete against guys like uh, Time. So if, so if we would say that, you know, part of um, the size is, might, is, is something that might give uh, the big four a little bit of, of an advantage, as you said, they've got the brand, they've got the capital, they've got the systems and processes. Mm -hmm. What is going to differentiate the winners and the losers? Is it really about the extent to which they might be able to embrace fintechs, for example? What is it that's going to be the new fight in the market uh, in the future versus the fight in the market right now? Yeah. So traditionally uh, in banking, you looked at uh, owning the whole value chain, if we call it vertical stack. So we, vertical means that you have the infrastructure, i.e. the core systems. Yeah. You develop the products yourself, banking, insurance products, and you have the customer interface through branches or telephone, as an example. And before a typical bank, they would say, we want to own all of those things. We want to have a big system. We want to produce our own products to differentiate them, and we want to go to the customers directly. Those are the cl classical vertical ways of competing. Mm. In banking today, you see that it is going from vertical competition to what we call horizontal or stack competition. So you have people only focus on infrastructure, people only focusing on deli delivering great products, yeah. and people only focusing on uh, customer interface. Mm. So in one extreme, you have the four big banks today that are vertically integrated. On the other extreme, you have people only going to fight you on the customer interface, mm -hmm. i.e. build a marketplace. For mm -hmm. example, we are going to build a marketplace for people who want to buy a house. And they can also get uh, interior design, you can get your carpenter, moving company, everything. So you kind of build an mm -hmm. ecosystem. But those players will only compete on being able to attract people in. The guys who are delivering the products could, could be an uh, upside, could be a netback, mm -hmm. it could even be a time per, mm -hmm. potentially. And of course, you also have other people delivering the, the infrastructure, maybe through cloud or mm -hmm. other ways of doing it. So. On one extreme, you have the e vertical. On the other side, you have people d competing on different stacks. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so that's going to be the big fight. And the, the, what the incumbents are thinking about today is, where do we play in that arena? The problem that the big four have today is that the, they see that guy like Tariq, right? You see, you see he's a very dynamic uh, <laughs> energetic guy, right? The, the thing is that you have a lot, lot of spaghetti and complexity and slow decision making in the yeah. big banks. So if they want to compete on this side, where it's more about speed, mm -hmm. agility, real customer understanding, is difficult to do it in the slow bureaucratic right. mothership. So what they are thinking about is, should we launch our own times, maybe mm -hmm. not, probably not call it time, but call it yes. some, something else, to be able to compete like guys like that? And do we have to compete on both owning the customer, doing the products, and also the infrastructure? Or are we going to launch ecosystems just based on owning mm. the customers? And the, the advantage that they have is that they already have millions of customers in their stall base. Yeah. So it's easy for them to transport some of those customers and fight this kind of game. And then this one time, mm. it basically starts from scratch. Uh, so, yeah. so Torik, I want us to test some of the problems <coughs> that we've labeled that you have. Um, and see how you feel about that. So um, I want to test this idea, the future being bionic, that you still need to retain to some extent a human interaction or, you know, as through the, the, the journey uh, of, of the clients and, and how that sits within your, your particular model. Um, and, and, and then maybe we'll pick up on some of this, uh, these ideas around what the actual fight in the future really looks like. I... I agree completely with Adam, right? So, so particularly in the South African context, you know, whilst the levels of digital literacy have been on the rise um, through the advent of social media and so on and so forth, um, they're still not at the levels where customers are entirely comfortable with, mm -hmm. with digital banking. So, so what we've done um, uh, from a business model point of view is, is a couple of things. We've, we've created a call center, mm -hmm. okay? Um, because when customers get stuck and there's no other form of self-service that they can follow, they need to speak to a human being. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is we have, um, we have put what we call ambassadors um, into most of our pick and pay and boxes stores where you find these kiosks. Now these ambassadors are all um, young adults that have been previously unemployed mm -hmm that come from previously marginalized communities. And we put them through a very special screening process yeah. and training program uh, and put them into store. But by the way, as a footnote, these ambassadors um, that are previously unemployed actually perform three times better than those with, with mm. experience. Sure. 
And, and their job is really to, to look the customer in the white of the eye and to create a sense of familiarity. Often they speak in the vernacular. Sometimes they know the customer from the community. Um, so so th that's absolutely critical um, to, our, to our strategy as well. Mm. What will happen with time as we, as we get smarter with this is we will start augmenting those human-assisted channels with the next level of technology as mm. well. So call center, you see the emergence of, of, of chatbots, mm. uh, which then switch over to, to, a, human, you, to a human being mm -hmm. that, that you chat with instead of speak to over the phone. It's cheaper, it's more comfortable for some, and more convenient for some customers. Mm -hmm. um, but also, what we will also do over time is create a service portal for mm -hmm. the ambassadors. You've got to be very careful which services you, you expose through that portal mm -hmm. um, because you can create... Um, um, problems in yeah. some instances, but, but that's sort of where we're going on mm. that. Mm. So, so th thank you for that. So I, I, I think the, s the blend of both the digital and the human touch is certainly, they're certainly bionic. But let's talk a little bit, uh, Tariq, I want to test this idea that Adam's put on the table about the fight for the future, not necessarily <laughs> just being vertical, um, probably being stacked uh, with different elements of the value chain coming through. Is that something that is uh, on top of mind as your business model, um, as you reiterate uh, through the process of, of your business model and strengthen the model in the market? Yeah, probably part of one of the first great lessons of business I learned um, in a previous life when I was a consultant like Adam here <laughs> um, was... The good, that good old days. Yeah, the good old <laughs> 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 that, that strategy is actually about tough choices. Mm. And, and, and one of the tough choices we had to make as, as South Africa's first digital bank was we cannot get into, into all things. Okay? Mm. So you've got to make very conscious decisions where you want to play, which products you want to be in, um, which channels you want to um, uh, reveal to your customers, and which bits of those ecosystems are you going to build and control because it's absolutely imperative to your sustainability and competitive mm -hmm. advantage, and which parts of the ecosystem are you happy to partner with other organizations mm -hmm. to bring mm -hmm. to bear. Now, w one of the things we were very deliberate about here is that our range of products that we will manufacture will be very narrow. Mm. So on the consumer side of things, we have a simple transactional bank account yeah. that fulfills the needs of our target segment, but has also um, really appealed to the needs of um, customers on either side of the segment. So SASA grant recipients sign yeah. up with us and affluent customers sign up with us as well. Um, and we will have a personal loan, which we, which we mm. recently mm. Uh, launched very gently into the market. What, what we won't be getting into in the foreseeable future is more complex problems, things that, that Adam has cited, things like um, home loans, for example, right. right? vehicle finance, because those products in particular are inextricably linked into the value chains. You have yeah. dealers, you have notaries, conveyances. It's complex mm. to deal with. What we will do, though, is we will um, use our digital platform to distribute other products right. to the consumer where it makes sense for mm. the consumer. Mm. Right? Mm. Now, now, that's critically important because where do the big banks grow? Right? So they either churn customers so they're not really creating additional access and market share or they get into these niche offerings right? Right. because w you have to. Right? But as you build a niche offering, you actually end up creating quite a bit of complexity and cost in the background, which then invariably gets passed on to the mm, customer. Mm. So we want to avoid that. We've, we've got a, um, a, a heuristic, a rule of thumb yeah. in the business, which is we design and service the 80%, not the 0.08%. And that's mm. a very tough call mm. we had to make to make sure that we can be sustainably mm. low cost. So that brings us to financial inclusion. <coughs> and, and I'm going to come back to Adam, and I do want to come back to you, uh, Torik, on that as well, because I know that the vision behind uh, the, the, the business is actually to drive inclusion. Adam, does the future of banking in South Africa come with lower fees and higher inclusion if we look at how the trends are converging and playing out against each other? No, definitely. If you, if you look at the fee structures, for example, current uh, fee account fees or fees for drawing out your own money from an ATM, uh, South Africa has ridiculously high fees. There's no other country in, on the planet that charges the kind of fees that South Africans are willing, uh, are willing to pay. Uh, because most of those transactions are becoming digital and most of them have a marginal cost of close to, close to zero. Mm. Still, South Africans are perfectly fine paying 
uh, something every month or every transaction, and that is going to go away quite, uh, quite, uh, quite fast. When we talk, but when we talk about uh, inclusion, and we did a large study in South Africa on inclusion, mm -hmm. and we saw that there are three levels of inclusion. One is just having access to an account. Uh, the second level is, do you actually use it? Yeah. If you have, can have one, but do you use it? That's a question mark. And the third one is around sustainability. Is it actually sustainable uh, the way you use uh, and handle your account? Mm. Uh, and if you look at South Africa, and we, and we compared South Africa to all other countries in similar situations, South Africa scores actually quite well on the, if you say the number of accounts per capita, South Africa actually scores quite, quite well. The problem is that if you look at the use that most people, at, particularly on the lower income range, uh, still has a very cash-based uh, cash economy. Mm -hmm. So they'll typically redraw the cash quickly after peop the people have deposited mm -hmm. money into their accounts. So they still uh, feel more comfortable having it under the mattress or yeah. using them in their local communities because it's a fairly cash-based community. So on usage, it's like yellowish to reddish. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem in South Africa is more on the sustainability. Right. Uh, and we see that for, particularly on unsecured credit or loans, we see people are pushing very aggressively to the market, uh, particularly low-income segment, mm -hmm. that you can get uh, credit to buy food or furniture or white mm -hmm. goods. But at, at the same time, you know that they, they will have difficulty paying back yeah. that credit. Mm -hmm. So yes, in the short term, you can blow up your balance sheet and it could look good because you acquire many customers. Longer term, a lot of people are not going to be able to pay back their loans. And mm -hmm. we're, going to get, we're going to get into a vicious, vicious death spiral. Mm -hmm. That's like we've seen in Greece, like we've seen in Turkey, many other countries that has followed the same kind of loose credit mm -hmm. policy towards mm -hmm. low-income segment. So when we talk about inclusion in South Africa, you can actually say a lot of people have access to financial services, yeah. actually, relatively speaking. But the way they use it, because uh, digital cash is still not very uh, mm -hmm. pronounced, and particularly the way it's being pushed and marketed to people who really can't afford it, yeah. we, are, we are very very worried about that. Mm. So you have to address all those three levels mm. to be able to say we truly have an inclusive society in South Africa. And so we bring back the 80% um, mm. decision, bold decision to say we will serve 80% and we're not looking to serve the 0 0.08. Talk to us a little bit about how financial inclusion finds expression in how Time Bank operates and, and, <laughs> and, and the kind of things that the business model is built on. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you ask that because I think we've been uh, lumped together with the other emerging digital banks, and, and that, that, that's obvious why, why that's mm -hmm. being done. Uh, but effectively, we're not in the business of digital banking. Mm. We're in the business of creating better access mm. uh, for ordinary South Africans. Now, digital banking is a means to, mm. to an end there. Adam makes a few good points. So, so over 80% of the country's adult population is now banked. Um, the vast majority are still underserviced. Now, a big reason for that is because our social grants distribution was handled in the country. So what happens is there's a big benefit for the payer, yeah. but not a clear benefit for the payee. Mm. So, so, so that's the one dynamic. The other dynamic here is that, um, and, and this is where, as Time Bank, we also have a lot of work to do in the market, is, is to gradually drive digital and financial adoption of these products, right? Because in, in a market as competitive as South Africa, mm -hmm. trust is everything. And, and, and we're not naive. We, we weren't expecting to sort of garner a whole bunch mm -hmm. of primary banking customers from the get-go. Yeah. We have to work hard. Mm -hmm. We have to work hard for that trust. Um, this, this really comes down to um, some of the key principles I laid out in, in the beginning here, which is about... Um, affordability, accessibility, and and trust, if you like, yeah. what I call dignity. Mm -hmm. um, so, so even the way the 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 way you lend, right? Um, South Africa's uh, consumer market is still um, heavily over indebted. We all know that, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that everyone yeah. is 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 overburdened. So, so it's about making sure that those are overburdened are remediated mm -hmm. and encouraging a, a, a culture of savings mm -hmm. um, and giving a better proposition for those um, that, that already have access mm. to loans. Mm. And of course, there are many lessons to learn from <coughs> banks that have been burnt uh, in South Africa that um, took the unsecured lending uh, model to the nth degree. And I think we're all familiar with, with, with some of those names. And before I come to you, Adam, on the very same question, Turek, 
how are you making sure that as you get bundled with other banks that are you know, emerging and so on, that you're quite distinct in terms of not only your messaging, but also operationally, that you're not con contributing to you know, uh, you know, a crisis of, an, of unsecured lending that we've seen in the country already? Because I would imagine that is part of a narrative that you're going to have to, uh, if you're not already, building very carefully to make sure that you stand out as distinct from that kind of practice. Yeah, so, so, so quite frankly, I, I, I don't lie awake much thinking about sort of how I differentiate uh, and create a distinct brand <laughs> from the competitors, it's more about doing what's right. Mm. Now, we don't have a growth at all cost mentality. That is absolutely irresponsible as a bank, right? So, so um, the, the biggest danger here is, is on the asset side of the business, right? right. When, you, when, you, when you lend irresponsibly. Now, th there's a couple of things here. The, the one is we, we actually, in the bigger scheme of things, don't have that aggressive uh, lending uh, uh, targets. Yeah. So, so, and I've gone publicly with this before. Um, our plan is to break even in three years' time from yeah. now. Um, in order to do that, we have to um, create the unsecured loan book of about two billion rand. Now, if you look at the entire personal loan uh, exposure in the South African market, that's about one percent. I stand under mm -hmm. correction. Um, so, so nothing aggressive. And then we've also got strategic flexibility in our business model. So if there's anything in the economy um, that, um, and you've got to consider we at almost unprecedented job loss rates now. Mm -hmm. right? If there's anything that allows us to pull back, we will be able to pull back, but we'll be able to increase the distribution of other products through our digital mm -hmm. platform to, to allow us to accelerate towards, towards break even. Then, then it's really about... Um, getting a deeper understanding of the customer's needs and being yeah. able to credit the system more precisely. Yeah. Now, the, this, um, to be able to unlock that, you need to have a proper data analytics strategy, right? Now, uh, Adam uh, spoke earlier about, about not, as a digital bank, not only being able to see all your information, yeah. uh, but but able to access other information. And, and through our partnership with Pick and Pay, we have access to Smart Shopper data, which mm -hmm. then gives us line of sight of what we call basket behavior, right. which is very exciting prospects for more mm -hmm. precise lending. Mm -hmm. um, now, what that will allow us to do will, will, is not only lend better to what we call thick file customers, mm -hmm. so customers with an extensive credit bureau record, mm -hmm. but also over time, start expanding access to what we will call mm. thin file customers mm. as well. Because this, this is becoming more of an imperative for the country, particularly since the National Credit Amendment Bill was signed, where, where this dispensation now given to customers who earn 7,500 rand or less a month, yeah. right, and who are over-indebted. Now, this is very dangerous mm. because banks are going to do one of two things. They're either going to pricing that additional risk, yeah. or they're going to pull back up, from that yeah. segment, and yeah. that's going to force our people back to predatory resources. Mm. The flip side of that coin, though, is that it's creating opportunity for fintechs and neobanks that are willing and able to render responsibly uh, to, to, to that vulnerable segment. Sure. Fantastic uh, insights uh, that you brought through the talk. And I, I, I want to just... Uh, uh, lift the opportunity uh, that Torik uh, has spoken about and the extent to which uh, you, you see the, the sector leaning towards that opportunity as more, as, as more players coming to the market. And I'd love your comment on the idea of, of a basket behavior and how that allows us to move from not just thick file uh, potential clients but also thin file as well and whether this is going to be a key game changer in terms of the journey towards uh, financial inclusion in the country. No, ab absolutely. Uh, and Torek is absolutely right. And uh, so uh, when I talk about the four different trends that mm. banks are facing, one of them is around data and the usage of data. And in BCG, we, we, have, we have hired 700 of the top data scientists around the world because everything we do is about data and digital these days. Uh, so, for example, when we talk to banks, as an example, we will always have data scientists with us in the room when we talk to banks because the ability to be able to analyze 
because the banks sit on a, a huge number, a, a lot of data internally, but you can also buy and access third-party data quite accessibly mm. these days. So if you're able to take all of that data and analyze it, you can have a one-to-one -one, uh, discussion, one-to-one -one approach to a customer and be able to have a much more targeted uh, approach towards that customer, mm. inc including the ability to be able to score the credit in a much better way than, than before. And will also open up doors uh, to be able mm. to include much more people mm. who previously have been not been able to uh, access credit mm. because of low credit uh, ratings. Mm. Mm. But with the ability to, to data mine and to have much more data around it, you can be able to reach much more people than yeah. you could uh, before. So there's no doubt that the, the, the influx of data and technology, access to technology, is going to make it much more accessible for, yeah. uh, for South Africans. At the same time, having said that, there are still a lot of South Africans that shouldn't get the credits that they are receiving today. So there's a flip. So, you, so, so mm. the, the regulator has an important role. On the one hand side, they want to get access to the low-income population. Mm. On the other hand, you don't want to, to, to have it too loose, so you end up in kind of some sort of credit spiral. Mm. So that's, it's, it's, difficult, it's a difficult role for the regulator yeah. to play, to balance both of those sides. Um, I can't remember who actually said this quote, but they said, you know, um, people need, uh, to, need to bank, but they don't need banks in mm -hmm. order to do that. And it almost sounds, if I go back to the earlier statement you made about consumers actually wanting the experience of convenience that they're finding on Uber, Uber Eats, Facebook, and everywhere within their own bank. So the question that I want to bring back to you is maybe a quote that uh, you have uh, said publicly before, and that is the idea that uh, going digital and digital technology more broadly actually isn't the silver bullet. And we've got to think a whole lot more broadly in terms of the different levers at our disposal to make sure that we're moving towards a space where the, the relevance of banking still sits within a society. If, if digital technology isn't the silver bullet, what else should we be looking at? It goes back to my point around the, the concept of uh, bionic banking. Mm. And if you think only digital, uh, you're going to have a big problem. We, we follow the 15 to 1600 largest fintechs in the world, time, uh, time actually being, being one of them. Uh, and and what's, what's interesting to see is that 10 to 15 years ago, people were willing to invest in fintechs who went straight to market, i.e. The, the time model. If you look at where the, the investors are putting money now, it is fintechs who are augmenting some of the existing players, either on the customer interface layer, the product layer, or the, in, or the infrastructure layer. Mm. And so most of the fintechs today, they're not attacking incumbents directly to the market. Mm -hmm. They're actually helping or augmenting uh, the bigger banks uh, because prob Tar Tariq's problem is how do you scale from that model? He says mm. he doesn't want to be everything to everyone, which I think is a correct, uh, correct uh, mm -hmm. statement. At the same time, if you want to make money in banking, you need to have um, a, a pretty large share of wallet. You have mm -hmm. to have offer different products. You have to have certain balance sheets and deposits and some sort of credit balance sheet as well. Mm. So the, for you to be able to make money over time, you actually need to have a bigger share of wallet. So what problems that Time Bank have had in other countries is scaling up. It's easy to get the first you know, thousands of customers, but getting to a million plus, that's, that's very difficult if you don't attack a larger uh, share mm. of the wallet. So that, that's why we see that mm. the, the funding in fintech today is going away from, let's call it B2C, mm. B2B place, and more towards B2B2C place, supporting mm. the existing banks rather than fighting them. Final question, as um, uh, we're hearing the sounds uh, from outside, I'd love for you to just respond very quickly as we begin to wrap to, to, to Adam. Um, if I've got my numbers correct, the, the ambition is to, is to hit 2 million customers over the next three years. Um, and, and so very deliberate, but as you said, speaking to this idea of, um, of, of, of a very deliberate, deliberate and strategic journey. How do you feel about uh, the, the issues that he's raised around scaling and saying, oh, it's going to be easy to hit the first early numbers, but the, the, the big challenge is actually going to be scaling over time? So, so a couple of things in response. The, the, the one is we've been growing at, at over 100,000 uh, customers comfortably uh, a month. Um, I, I, I actually can't see that um, tapering off over the next, over the next three years. Uh, the founding team has been involved mm. with two scaled digital mm. deployment uh, uh, in South Africa before. And, and we've gotten to uh, 3 million and 5 million customers respectively. Mm -hmm. so, so I actually don't see that being an issue. It's mm -hmm. more about being disciplined around your cost control. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that you're able to generate the returns mm -hmm. off the business that you mm -hmm. actually have. And Tarika, just a final question. I'd love for you to respond to another labeling uh, from Adam again, that this time your problem is uh, the problem of scale. Um, and, and, and if I've got the numbers right, I think it was about 2 million um, uh, clients or customers over the next over the three years, and that's the journey that you've outlined for yourself and the team. Your response to, to that scale question and whether you are going to be able to scale uh, beyond the first million? Yeah, we, so we've uh, been acquiring uh, comfortably over 100,000 customers a month, and, and I don't see that tapering off uh, anywhere in the near future. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the, the one is that those customers are coming through our existing assets, right? So, so those are 730 kiosks in 730 pick and brain box stores, mm -hmm. and a little bit of uh, uh, customer acquisition through the website. We've got a partnership-led business model, the concept that, that Adam spoke of earlier, which, which allows us to expand beyond our existing partner. It mm. doesn't have to be another retailer. Mm. Right? It can be, can be another organization that gives us access to customers, data, uh, brand affinity, and so mm. on. Now, um, the, the most obvious place to grow um, is in the rest of the ARC ecosystem, mm. our majority shareholder. Um, because they hold another over 40 um, investments. Um, and there's opportunity not only to acquire customers there, but to get, for example, the salary into the accounts so of digitizing right. those payments, uh, or to digitize workman compensation payments, or to digitize pension payments. Yeah. Um, so you're not, you don't only drive uh, stepwise growth in customer acquisition, but you get to the tipping point around customer adoption as well. Mm. Um, then the, the other option that we have uh, over time is to build a sort of proprietary distribution channel where, where we don't acquire through our partner channels, but we actually go uh, with our mobile kiosk, which will be mm. available this year, which is a, a portable version of our existing kiosk, same functionality, and that uh, allows us to go deeper into community mm. as well. So, so, so I'm not too concerned uh, about us uh, plateauing uh, mm. on customer acquisitions. Well, there you have it. The CEO of uh, Time Bank says not too concerned about uh, plateauing and in terms of their growth story and scaling up. And uh, that, of course, uh, is uh, Tariq Karan. He is the CEO. And uh, he was also joined by Adam Iqdal, the Managing Director and Partner at BCG South Africa, laying out the trends that are really shaping the future of banking in South Africa. And the core of this conversation is whether that future comes with lower fees and higher higher inclusion as well. Thank you very much for making the time to join us. Uh, if you would like to continue this conversation, we're really keen to hear from you. Follow us at, at CNBC Africa using the hashtag uh, CNBC Africa Exchange as well as WEFA19, that's W-E-F-A-19. I'm Nozipo Mbanjoa. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.